So continuing along the theme of agile development and our experiences with it, uh, we've got another talk about uh, experiences in, in agile development. Uh, we've got another one following that. So these are, it's a section of kind of 30 minute sections. Another one on teaching agile. And I forget what the last one is. Hang on a second. I'll put my thing down. We'll, we'll introduce them as each talk goes on. Oh, okay, we've got it here. Uh, the last one is on domain specific modeling, which also has links into agile development as well. So uh, let me hand over. Okay, hi. So uh, my name is Johan Brichot. This is actually a, a bit of a spin off of the talk of, of Monday, uh, which I intended to include a little bit of our agile experiences. And then because there was an agile day, uh, the board asked me, well, can you make a separate talk of that? So that's basically what I've been doing. Um, our experiences doing agile development in the wild, right? So first of all, uh, a disclaimer, uh, what I am not, I'm nothing certified, I'm nothing an evangelist, not being a guru, so I have no um, agile labels stuck onto my head or anything. Um, and I'm also not an experienced non-technical presenter, uh, much more comfortable talking about the technical presentation I did on Monday, for example. So, um, but I mean, doing one year of development, uh, agile development for in the real, uh, for a commercial product, uh, we did uh, some experiences and I actually want to share the experiences that we learned, which we will use in the next projects we are doing. So things we did wrong or things we noted and everything. Um, so what's the story? Um, most of you know I was, an academic researcher for 10 years, so Agile is actually a natural environment for me. The development we've been doing all the time was const constantly Agile, so we were working with other people from the same university, different universities, code bases, refactoring, throwing code away, that was actually uh, pair programming, prototyping, all those things we are used to. So actually, and most of you actually also do that, so I'm not going to talk about anything of that. Um, for me, that's a natural environment. We applied it in the real world, and what's that? Well, for us it was including the customer into the case, because for researchers, we're just our own customers. We are working on something, and we say, okay, this should be changed, so our own feedback loop was ourselves. So now suddenly, we have this external person in the process, in the loop, he doesn't know anything about development, but he's, he wants to, so they are, the, in our case, this customer, he's really into agile development, so he's in the process, and he's very positive towards it, that's how it should work, so he's working together with us, and nonetheless, um, we did learn a lot. So in this talk, as I told you, it's also an agile talk for me. Didn't prepare anything before the conference. <laughs> I wrote up some slides here, because I actually would want to be in the audience instead of talking here. Uh, I would lo love to hear about others' experiences doing agile development. So I also want feedback here, uh, which is basically the key. So I don't want this to be a talk. I want this to be a discussion. Um, Whenever you feel that I'm saying rubbish <laughs> or you want to add your own experiences, please um, raise your hand or just start talking. I want this to be more or less a discussion. If that doesn't happen, well, um, it's going to be fairly quick over. So I'll just first get started a little bit on, on a side note. Um, is that in the beginning of our project, well, also we had to do with some legal, legal issues on our contract and everything. And we were a little bit in an... Uh, in a food for oil program with a law firm, which is a very no well-known law firm in Belgium uh, handling ICT projects. And we did some consultancy for them, uh, showing how to handle quality in software projects and so on. And we got a fair bit of information on uh, some of the things they were doing in failed IT projects. Um, they are handling either from a customer or provider side, uh, handling the, the legal problems. So when, when, when things go to court, uh, in failed IT projects. And we learned things that we, should, we didn't want those guys against us at some point. So although they were seeing in our contract that, that, that we put up that more and more they also see this agile development going on, so non, no all requirements uh, are not put in the beginning of, of the project, but they are putting in milestones in projects and so on, and you see an agile scope. So they say, yeah, we see this more and more, but the courts and, and everything around the process is not agile. So it's not that the software is the most important thing when you deliver it to your customer, but if things get wrong and you end up in court somewhere, which we don't, eh, I want to be very clear, so that's the, the theoretical scenario you didn't want to end up in, but I, I just want to give this because we learned a lot from them, 
uh, talking to them and so on. Uh, in the end, you've got to do paperwork. You have to do formal acceptance testing, which is basically not what you want to be doing in an agile environment where the software is the most important one. You need to write up the requirements, what the customer asks, so we're able to prove, well, the software is doing that, yes and no. Because when it ends up, it will be used against you. Um, code quality monitoring, something else actually, that's something we learned them, maybe, is that, well, if things go wrong, they will point you to code quality problems in your code, and okay, so you better be documenting, tracing it, trace your stuff, trace that incoming bugs. So we have lots of paperwork behind the scenes, have all the time of milestones. We try to minimize that, but at least we did the exercise of, okay, just have this as a good procedure to, to continue in other projects whenever something would go wrong in the future, that at least we can provide, we can show that we have been doing everything to make the initial requirements come true. So that's just a message to everybody doing out there agile development. That's the message we got. I don't know if there are different experiences or bad experiences, good experiences, or I'm talking completely rubbish. Well, at least that's not what uh, these experts told me. So that was uh, just a bit of a side note of the thing we were trying to say, okay, coming from a research context where it's we will never get sued if something is, is not uh, being found. Um, so what we confirmed about, about agile development, that's basically, well, pair programming works, right? Um, we had uh, in our team, in our small team, three people, we had at least one person who wasn't very, uh, or not at all uh, into Seaside, for example. And, well, doing some sessions together made him, are you still hearing me? Made him actually more comfortable in Seaside. And he learned a lot of we doing stuff in the code and ah, you can do it like that. So the pair programming really works. And I probably don't have to repeat that, but ah, some things say you, yeah, you should always be pair programming and you have this formal process of pair programming and the one shouldn't touch the keyboard and blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, don't follow that. Um, do it on a need by need basis. And we are just very keen on, oh, I have this problem, I want to know that. Just come and sit next to me and team up for a short period of time, do that pair programming and then just go away again. And there's no formal process in there. And of course, tests, tests, tests. Yeah. Just to add to that, um, in, in London, certainly, pair programming is not a non-issue these days. The banks and a lot of the big companies around London, they are now quite used to seeing pairs of developers working on code. So it's kind of one of those things that may actually become less of an issue worldwide. I don't know if you, London is unique to that. There's been quite a lot of agile projects, but I just kind of wanted to add that insight. Yeah, so that, that's true. That's also what these lawyers told us. You see more and more projects getting an agile scope where they are talking about these concepts, but they always told us, okay, but do the formal stuff as well. But yeah, so it's probably not unique in London. But, um, so another thing, of course, is tests, 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 tests. Right? Well, that's just what we confirmed. So I have no surprises there. Probably a little bit more on, on our customer relationship side, or at least the non-technical persons providing the requirements and testing the system. Um, is what we learned and what we would do a little bit different or maybe emphasize more in the future. Um, they're a bottleneck. Hmm? Yeah, I put this a bit blunt, but they're the bottleneck. Um, if you have a, a team of people working on, on the software, you want a continuous stream of things that they can handle on, that they can work on, uh, that you're not waiting for feedback so that you can process it, and that you're also not um, waiting for a long time, continuing development, and then have to actually revert a lot of things. Bec two months ago, you were sending in a, an iteration version, having some functionality to test, and they only see this two months later, uh, and you've been building up onto the functionality. So we need to monitor that more closely. That's something we definitely uh, will be doing a bit more in the, in, the, in the future. So that feedback loop should be monitored closely. Don't let this just grow out of hands. Maybe this is just us being our first project, but yeah, Diego. I think there is a second part that, that I, I definitely agree, the, the customer is the bottleneck there, but when the customer doesn't give you feedback, you probably uh, should also be alarmed that something is wrong. They're not testing it, so they're not interested in the project somehow that's not a good sign. So be alarmed if, if the feedback loop 
uh, on your customer side is really uh, growing long. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, so you're talking actually about, about also using monitoring tools maybe on, on the customer side for seeing what, what exactly they are doing? Are you thinking about that as well? Oh, you're, you're, you're assuming that every, every, um, everything should contain a bug, right? So that, that's, that's the good verification. You just put some bugs in there and then <laughs> you know if they stumble upon it. Yeah. Eh, that's a good suggestion. Um, so another one is that the feedback source is certainly different. Um, we were working at least with, with our you and I think that's in the majority of, of, of uh, situations, you will have a contact person somewhere who is actually acting with the development team and, and, and being the first contact for the rest of the organization because not all people who will eventually work with the product will actually test the product. Uh, they're just people who are not into that and don't do will not do it. And I think the feedback we got first off from the contact and then when the product was handed a bit further in the or organization, tested by other users, you get different kinds of feedback. And we really noticed that probably you don't want this, the, uh, the system to be tested for a long time only by your contact. It probably has to go deeper into the organization. I don't know if that's feasible. Uh, I don't know at all. But probably at least we saw that real users in the organization will eventually use you get conflicting feedback, really. Things you changed first, and then they ask for changing it again. So things like that you will see, and you actually have to deal with it. How, what do we do? But this causes overhead, once again. And similarly to, to do they test the functionality, it's also hard for, for people who test it to actually test the functionality you've been delivering every iteration. Um, we were delivering an iteration um, in the beginning a bit more um, run, run over time, but um, in the second part of the project, every two weeks an iteration version was sent. And you can say, okay, grosso modo, uh, in, in large, these are the things we put into it, please test it. But probably we'll forget things. So you need also traceability about stuff you've added so that they will focus on that functionality to test and don't get stuck in some part maybe that in the beginning of the, the application that bothers them so that they don't continue further down the line. So you want to train them a bit more or at least tell them a lot, look, test this, is this exactly what you want? And you need overhead for that. And that's stuff, well, we as beginners didn't count, take into account beforehand because that takes you time. You will always have to go. Eh? And that's, um, I have it on another, another slide. So probably we did different things. Sometimes we went to demo an entire application to really show them. Another time we just gave them the thing and you get different kinds of feedback and that's, that's interesting because um, if you demo it then w you're actually showing them this is how the functionality works and they will follow you and they will try it and okay they will be more into it. And while you just give it, you're actually assuming that the application is so clear that they can immediately use it. And so the zero learning curve um, idea. And well, those are different ways of, of testing whether the functionality you implemented really works as they expected it to be. Um, another thing is that <laughs> we noticed a lot that sometimes they were just quickly like, oh, at the end of a phone call, oh yeah, and that feature, we would like it. And uh, a feature which had a big impact, uh, a, a very hard change on the entire system, but they didn't realize. And on the other hand, sometimes they were reluctant to ask us something which was pretty simple to implement. So they have no idea what the complexity in time and uh, no, difficulty is for implementing certain features. And you have to just well monitor that and tell them, well, just tell us anything. Because of course that customer also says, well, I'm paying them and I should actually, uh, at the end of the project, everything should be implemented. So I'm a bit reluctant asking them things that they will do, but consume time for the project and actually consume stuff. So, but they should actually tell us everything and then we should filter. Okay. Yeah, Neil. I 
see people agreeing or disagreeing, so please interrupt me. Uh, does that feed into the agile practice of trying to get your customers to say how important things are to them? Give them, you know, 100 points or 100 jelly beans or something and say, all right, allocate the value to you. Don't tell me to do or not do uh, because you don't know how much it will cost, but do tell me how much it would be worth. Give them some finite pool and tell them to allocate points or whatever. Uh, did you try to do that? Uh, Hmm, did we try? Yeah, um, uh, certainly, in, in an informal way, absolutely. Uh, so what is most important to you? Uh, please tell us. So uh, more or less, what is most important to them, they were, they were telling us. Um, but I guess that the, the importance of, of a feature sometimes uh, is independent of, of their the pros thinking process of, okay, how much will this cost me? Uh, although, uh, as I will notice later on, a, a fixed budget project, for example, but still you're consuming time. Uh, so uh, this is something I really like to have, but I'm reluctant to ask because it might be actually just too costly to implement and I will just deal with it. So yeah, but it, I think for them as well, it's a conflicting issue. So they just should give us both. They should just tell us, give us the value, give us everything, and we will tell you how, uh, how expensive it is. So that's, uh, that's the thing I was telling, just we were giving iterations, just giving it to them and, and or completely describing it and you get different kinds of feedback. So that was the, the first point there. Um, another thing, if you're doing agile development and that's something, well, we didn't quite account, take into account at the beginning is that, especially in this, this kind of application we built is that they, uh, over the course of one year, they really build up a, uh, a mirroring database. So that while they are testing, they are creating a database which mirrors the thing they would do if the system would be in production. And they really love that, um, well, you carry the database from one iteration version to another with all migration problems during development, especially uh, associated to that. So we didn't take that into account, but that's something they really love to have. And I agree completely for us as well. It's great because you have almost live data growing while you are developing the project so you can see uh, how they are using it. You can watch if your system still performs as well as you want it to be. So you actually have real life data you can also experiment with, something you don't want to put time in. So the testing database grows, just use it. But it's a pain because like you have to migrate and, and stuff will actually start going wrong. Bugs will be introduced just because of migrating. and. Well, the one who tests it doesn't know because it's, it's you doing bad development or maybe just the migration of the database that has some, some problems. So that's, uh, that's basically the, the thing we would be doing different or handling at least explicitly in, in, in next uh, Agile projects which we are doing. So we're, le we're learning on the job, right? And we have a, a cool customer right now which is very, very fond of what we are doing and, and is, well, we are just lucky that we don't have this... Uh, very uh, <laughs> nasty person sitting there on the other hand who is beating us at every time. So they are, so we are lucky. So that's a that's a cool thing for us to have, of course. Um, at, uh, very early in the beginning, we had this problem, uh, and and that's a problem you see reoccurring. Every I want to see more discussion on this. Um, you got an agile process, so as they were giving us. Basically, these are the basic requirements, and if that's okay, and we try to assess, because it was a fixed budget. Yeah, this is the budget you get, um, that's it. How can much can you do, and we should commit. Hmm. Great, but if you can change the requirements while we are going, how can we tell you how much this costs? So you make some modules, you, you divide the project into modules, you make some assessment, and you try at least, well, boxing everything into parts so that you only consume a certain part of the time on a certain module so that you keep time for the rest. But in the end, uh, it still remained well. Uh, we've tracked this quite well. I think it went all okay, but in the end, they always come up if the project is finished, the budget has been used, and they say, okay, uh, we actually wanted this feature also. And then you're up to, uh, yeah, but <laughs> everything has been consumed, so what now? Uh, so I extend, well, then there should be a budget extension, right? That's true. Yeah, Diego. So what we did, and I think works pretty well, is make the customer responsible for uh, the budget. To say, okay, an iteration has this many points or some other uh, measurement, and when they come with features, okay, you give them an amount of points. 
and uh, they can decide whether it's worth to be put in or not. Okay, yeah, so that's basically some at some point informally we did some, some stuff like that, so uh, Joachim, right? I guess it's the right, w right thing to do, but on the other hand, I, I, I would fear that uh, the customer might think, um, are you gambling with me or what? I mean, is it like uh, me having some chips feeding you with them every week or every fortnight? So uh, I guess it's the right way to go to say, well, every change within the process, and we're prepared, prepared for changes, um, needs to prioritize, but also monetize to some, to some extent. So every iteration has its price, and you can use points, of course, uh, but on the other hand, um, um, customers are not used to those processes yet. So they, they, they might think you're just totally crazy or maybe gambling or whatever. I mean, they will probably not like the idea. So how, how would you handle that? Well, you make explicit, you take the short-term risk. You, when you say this, this costs five points, and then it costs five points, period. Whether you're, it costs you five hours or 20 hours, it, it, the feature gets done for five points. And uh, long-term risk, them adding more and more features, uh, stays with them. Because uh, uh, then you're adding iterations containing those features, saying, okay, these features are this big. So it gives them very uh, a, b a very big control over what gets done, uh, because they say okay, uh, because and uh, yeah you have to add them in that you say we, f we should concentrate on the things that are important for you and we put uh, we put them first, and then in the end well we can uh, uh, it's up to you how much unimportant features you do. An another option that is a possibility is to do a small fixed price piece of the work first and build trust with the customer so that you can then move on to something that's a little, bo a little more fluid where you can kind of renew kind of sprint to sprint. I think often it's an element of trust building up, you know, you're, you're working with someone and maybe they don't know you and they, they don't understand the process and if you can do an element of fixed price, a small slice of it and, and work together on that, then you, you learn you know, both sides and, and maybe can then renew it. Yes, yeah, uh, to repeat, the, the customer is allowed to stop after that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, there's two raising hands. Oh, sorry. sorry. Just to comment on that, borrowing a, a technique from uh, portfolio management, one of the approaches we did was to, to graph um, requested features and put them into a matrix with, a, with an estimated cost in terms of effort and um, showing a, a blob size, if you like. And then on the axes, you, you map how important is it strategically to the customer, and on the other axis, how, how well is it being done now? And then things kind of collect in the corner that are being done badly but are very important. <laughs> and then the size gives you an indication of, of you know, what's the cost. <coughs> And a related trick is you, you have dependencies where um, anything that they want that has dependencies, you accumulate the cost into the thing they've chosen, um, which provokes a lot of discussion around, well, do we really need all of that? Or do we, you know, can we reduce that functionality so we take out some of the dependencies? And you get some very interesting debates going. Yeah. Um, well, first in the back, maybe Neil or, ah, sorry, James. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'll just go. <laughs> Whoever gets the mic first. Hi, Jill. Uh, one question. You have a lot in your project. You have a lot of uh, uh, mouse interaction. So could you find any process to automate the, tes the test for your uh, GUI uh, interaction? Um, is the question how the process for the UE interaction testing, how we did that? Testing, um, written automated tests um, using web tester, seaside testing, and so on. Yeah, that's is that or what you wanted to ask? Yeah, 
for instance, you need to drag and drop the mouse or whatever. So could you automate this manual gestures? Yes, there is the there is there is there are automated techniques for client side web testing. Yeah, yeah. You take a look at Selenium uh, web tester, uh, C side testing, and so on. Yeah, you can write unit tests basically like that. It's uh, it's also very uh, you need to test a lot. <laughs> Getting back to the earlier discussion, is the point not that it isn't just the customer who can't say how much it will cost to implement a feature? We can't say it either, and so in the meeting with the customer, you can't say this feature feature will cost five points. The customer can perhaps meaningfully say, I think this feature is worth 10 points to me, or 10 chocolates. You know, I'll put chocolates on all the features, and you get to eat the chocolates for exactly. the ones you deliver. But at the start of the week, you don't know how many of them you'll have delivered by the end of the week, y any more than the customer does. And okay. so any, any points you bring in for the cost to implement are going to be fantasy, even if you're doing them, not the customer. That's completely All the correct. customer can do is motivate you, and then you go away and do you, you aim to eat as many chocolates as you can on the Friday meeting or uh, the next iteration. Yeah, it's completely correct, but I think the point is that you have to break it up into smaller chunks. You can, you can estimate the smaller chunks uh, a bit more accuracy, and that at least um, a big chunk doesn't fall off at the end. Uh, was there something more? Okay, so yeah, that's uh, uh, probably um, some of the things to, to estimate. This also takes time, right? So you have to, yep, oh yeah, yep. Just one comment about the, the budget. I've been working with Agile for a couple of years. We tried different approaches, some of them very crazy. Uh, and after some years, we get to one simple conclusion. It's everything about trust. So nowadays, what we do with our customers is we work time and materials. We make a, a gross estimate and we compromise to help the customer solve his problem. And if we spend more hours, we charge those hours. Th that is working for us, but I repeat, it's about trust. If your customer doesn't trust you, you can that, that's a bootstrap issue. So, and exactly, the issue is was the biggest at the beginning of the project. Afterwards, I, no problem. We just had this. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is this is great. This is more or less what I've been wanting. So thank you for for these discussions. And um, as I said, it's me who wants to learn from you. So I I get a good feedback. And I actually had more slides, more issues to put up if there wasn't enough discussion. So this has been great. So um, thank you very much. And. Good afternoon. <laughs>